Hammerhead sharks are perhaps some of the most iconic and easily recognisable fish in our oceans today, with the bizarre head shapes making these extraordinary animals stand out quite obviously from their close relatives. But how exactly did these remarkable sharks evolve to look like this? And what are the hammerheads even used for? First of all though, what are these organisms? The hammerhead sharks are all members of the family Sphernidae, which is itself a part of the order Carcariniformes, the ground sharks. Ground sharks include many other different families and species, including the tiger shark, cat sharks, and weasel sharks. Within the hammerhead family, there are two different recognised genera. These are Eusphyra and Sphyrna. Eusphyra only contains a single species, the winghead shark whereas Sphyrna contains at least eight species, though this number differs between sources. Hammerhead sharks are actually really quite diverse in their head shapes, ranging from the winghead shark, which has a head that can reach a width of half of its own body length, all the way to the bonnet head, which possesses the smallest protrusions and has a more shovel-shaped head. There are then all sorts of intermediate lengths between these two extremes within the Sphyrnid family. So what could this fascinating bit of anatomy possibly be being used for? Well, there are actually quite a few different functions that these structures, known technically as cephalofoils, have been suggested to do. One of these ideas is that they have a use in the hydrodynamics of the animals. It has been noted by scientists that the cephalofoils have a remarkably similar structure to an airfoil, with the lower side being flatter and the upper surface being more rounded, perhaps providing lift in larger species and some degree of increased manoeuvrability. A 2003 study actually put this proposal to the test by comparing the movements of two juvenile hammerhead species to a sandbar shark. This study found that the hammerheads did indeed turn more often and more sharply than the other shark, although they did not roll their bodies as they turned, so the cephalophile is probably not used like a steering wheel, but it does appear to keep the fish stable as they turn quickly. Hammerheads are also some of the most negatively buoyant of all shark species, and therefore the airfoil shape of the hammers could potentially provide the animals with the lift they need to swim more efficiently. Another proposed function for the cephalofoil is that they improve the shark's sense of smell. There was an interesting study from 2010 in which researchers discovered that sharks were able to tell which nostril detects a scent first and then turn very fast to face the direction of the source. And so, since most species of hammerhead sharks have nostrils placed far apart from each other on the cephalofoil, it enables them to better detect differences in the times that scents enter the nostrils at smaller angles and at faster swimming speeds. The wide spacing of the nostrils would also enable these animals to detect odours in a larger volume of water, and allow faster identification of the direction it is coming from. And additionally, an enlarged olfactory organ in hammerhead sharks supports this idea of a better sense of smell. But it's not just the sense of smell that is potentially improved by this anatomy. These animals also seem to have enhanced depth perception. In a paper published in 2009, this idea was tested when scientists examined the sight of the sharks by putting electrodes into the eyes and then moving a light to different positions, measuring the field of vision of each eye and therefore working out by how much the fields overlap. This was tested in the bonnet head, the scalloped hammerhead, and the wing head, as well as the non-hammerhead lemon and blacknose sharks. The results of the study indicated that the species with the widest cephalofoil, the winghead shark, had the largest binocular overlap, whereas those without cephalofoils, as well as the bonnet head shark with its very small cephalofoil, had a much smaller amount of overlap. So this study provided some good support for the idea that these structures would give hammerhead sharks a better sense of sight, since a greater degree of binocular overlap enhances the depth perception and would make locating prey by eye much easier. Finally, the cephalofoil may improve the shark's sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. Sharks all have specialised pores positioned on the underside of their heads, known as ampullae of Lorenzini, which act as electroreceptors that can allow these animals to detect the subtle electric fields produced by other living organisms. Hammerhead sharks actually have a higher concentration of these pores on the lower surface of their heads compared to other sharks, and since there is an expanded area, it means many more of these pores can be present and spread over a larger region in hammerheads. Observations of great hammerheads swimming very close to the seabed and swinging their cephalofoil from side to side as they go, almost like a metal detector, seem to support this idea, since these animals prey on stingrays which often bury themselves in the sand. It's been reported that the hammerheads will then suddenly turn and quickly excavate a buried stingray which they then consume further suggesting that the cephalofoils, with their greater concentration and wider distribution of ampullae, enable these animals to prey on certain creatures that other species of sharks would have a more difficult time locating. 
So we've seen that the cephalophores are incredibly useful structures that can be used for all sorts of purposes, and it's therefore very clear why they would be beneficial to the spheronids and why they would evolve. But how exactly did this evolution take place? What would the first hammerhead shark ancestors have looked like? Well, originally it was thought that hammerhead shark evolution went something like this. The cephalophoil must have developed gradually over time, originating from a shark that had a more typically shaped head. Spheronids most closely resemble the carcharinids, the requiem sharks, and so it makes sense to assume that the ancestor of these animals looked something like this, perhaps appearing a lot like the spade nose shark. The cephalophoil would then have progressively grown more and more expanded as the lineage evolved, and so it was thought that the most ancestral or basal of the hammerhead sharks would be the bonnet head, since this is the shark with the smallest cephalophoil, and the most advanced or derived member is the wing head, with the largest relative cephalophoil. All the other species of hammerheads would then fit in between these two taxa somewhere along the lineage as small cephalophoils evolved to become larger and different species over time. However, it turns out that it is not quite as simple as this. Using data from the mitochondrial and nuclear DNA of several hammerhead shark species, researchers in 1993 and then 2010 found that while their results did indeed support the hammerheads as all sharing a common ancestor that evolved from the carcharinids, the way in which the cephalophoil evolved was pretty unexpected. This molecular data actually indicates that the wing head is the most basal member of this group and was the first to diverge from the common ancestor, whereas the bonnet head is in fact the most recent species to evolve so the complete opposite of what was predicted. How did this happen then? It appears as though the ancestor of these sharks didn't actually live all that far in the past, in geological terms at least, existing in our planet's waters about 20 million years ago. This ancestral species would have had a large body size, and somewhere along the early evolution of the lineage, a highly expanded cephalophoil must have developed quite rapidly. So the first hammerheads were big animals with big hammers, and then over time the species we see today diversified and radiated out from these first forms, producing species that have smaller cephalophoils. There's more physical evidence that supports this timing of cephalophore evolution too. The wing head, which was found to be the first living shark to diverge in this lineage, actually has its nostrils positioned closer to the middle than in other hammerheads, suggesting it cannot sample as much of the water for odours as others can, and this ability evolved later on in the more derived species. Additionally, the pores for the electroreceptors are clustered closer to the midline in the wing head, suggesting that as more hammerheads speciated under certain selection pressures, it drove the evolution of the cephalophore for detecting electric fields. By studying the DNA evidence, researchers who published the 2010 paper were also able to determine that after the initial large-bodied ancestor, hammerhead sharks later evolved small body size on two separate occasions. This occurred once in the winghead shark, and once in the lineage including the bonnet head. The reason for this evolutionary convergence on smaller bodies has been suggested to be due to the animals putting more energy into reproductive methods than growing to large sizes. It also seems as though the smaller species of hammerheads actually don't get the benefit of lift from the cephalophoils, whereas the larger species do, and so different selection pressures acting on the different lineages meant that now the smaller taxa only use their strange head shapes for the improved senses, and not for hydrodynamic purposes. So, the evolution of these wonderful, strange sharks appears to be far more complex than we originally imagined, and new discoveries in the future, perhaps including more complete hammerhead shark fossils, could always change how exactly we understand these remarkable creatures to have evolved. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and make sure to catch the next episode of Shark Week 2019, in which Ollie is going to be looking at the smallest shark species. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.